When it comes to climate change, the cake is baked. It is too late to do anything about it. At this point, all we can do is sit back and get ready for a truly wild ride, right? <laughs> the idea that it's all over, and we're all going to hell in a handbasket anyway, so the best thing we can do is sharpen up our prepper skills, build a place off the grid to live out our days in a real life version of some apocalyptic novel. That's not just a myth, it is a dangerous one. Yes, it is true that since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we have increased the amount of carbon in the atmosphere by almost 50%. And yes, it is true that the average temperature of the Earth has already warmed by a degree Celsius or one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. And yes, it's also true that even if there were a magic switch we could somehow flip today to turn off all of our coal and oil and gas immediately, we'd still see some warming from what we've already put up in the atmosphere. Just as if your doctor told you that you had some seriously blocked arteries and had to make some lifestyle changes right away. It's never too late to change and we all know that doing so could avoid some serious and even potentially life-threatening consequences. But at the same time, a lifetime of poor diet and little exercise will take some time to deal with. And it is true, there are some, like the tribes in Louisiana who are becoming climate refugees after persistent flooding is forcing them to relocate, or the people of Kivalina in Alaska who are seeing the permafrost their homes are built on thaw and crumble out from under them. They are already experiencing dangerous impacts. But the quicker we wean ourselves off of our dirty old ways of getting energy, the less temperature change we'll see and the lower the risk of serious and even very dangerous impacts will be for all of us. Our choices today will make a big difference to our future. That's why I decided to go to the climate talks in Paris in December of 2015. I went to France not just as a scientist, I went as a human, as a mother, and as a person who believes that we have to act. I went with colleagues who are medical doctors, faith leaders, city mayors, politicians, musicians, lawyers, policy experts, and just plain human beings. We all went to Paris together to support the leaders of 195 nations who have formally adopted an agreement to limit the rise in global temperatures to below two degrees Celsius, and possibly below one and a half degrees if we can, because the lower we go, the safer we'll be. There isn't just one magic number here. Doing nothing about climate change will be far more expensive, both in dollars and in human lives, than acting now. Our choices make a difference, and that is why honoring the commitments that the world collectively made in Paris is so important. Cities are on board. Churches are on board. Companies are on board. We need the fossil fuel industry on board too. After all, they're the ones involved in extracting and producing the fossil fuels that are the main reason we're in this situation to begin with. First of all, we have to cut our carbon emissions and the emissions of all the other heat trapping gases like methane from cow farts and nitrous oxide from fertilizers. And second, we have to help poor countries, many of whom are already suffering the impacts of climate change today to prepare and adapt to a warmer world. So how do we cut our carbon emissions? A big piece of the pie comes from being a lot more efficient in the way we use our energy. Us North Americans, we're some of the most wasteful people in the world when it comes to energy and food and garbage and pretty much everything. The good news is that when we save energy, we save money. So efficiency though, all by itself, isn't enough. We also have to wean ourselves off carbon. And we are already a good ways down that path today. Wind and solar energy is booming, not just here in North America, but even on the other side of the world, where China is the world leader in producing energy from both wind and sun. But the reality is, it's hard to do in time when the true cost of the carbon we burn is not being reflected in the price we pay at the pump or in our electricity bill. We need to get rid of our old, dirty energy, like coal-fired power plants, even faster than we already are. We need new technology to be developed and implemented, from solar shingles to giant wind turbines in the air or under the water, faster than it is today. And we need a price on carbon that lets the market pick the winners and the losers. Would a price on carbon really work? You can ask the province of British Columbia. They've been doing it for almost a decade now. In 2008, 
they implemented what they call a revenue neutral carbon tax. In other words, it returns now about a billion dollars a year to taxpayers. British Columbia now has the lowest personal income tax rate in Canada and one of the lowest corporate tax rates in all of North America. All of this is fine and good, but how can we help poor people in Africa, Southeast Asia, and even Latin America at the same time? Developed countries have produced the majority of carbon emissions, yet developing nations bear the brunt of its impacts because they are the most vulnerable. And they're the least responsible for this problem. According to Oxfam, the poorest half of the world has only produced 10% of global emissions. That's why in Paris, the have nations pledged to financially support the have not nations through a green climate fund that's meant to help support both climate mitigation and adaptation efforts. Mitigation because energy poverty is real. There's over a billion people around the world who don't have access to electricity. And the answer to climate change isn't to freeze them in their tracks and return us all to the Stone Age. Nor is it, as some have argued, that poor nations need more fossil fuels and that greater tragedies can be avoided by simply using them than by not. There's a giant hole in that argument. Do poor nations have big reserves of fossil fuels? With a few exceptions, no, they don't. Of the world's remaining coal and oil and gas reserves, just 6% lie in all of Africa and 3% in Southeast Asia. We all do need energy to rise out of poverty and to build resilience to a changing climate. And that is why the Green Climate Fund focuses on both adaptation and mitigation to help the poor prepare for the impacts of climate change while at the same time accelerating their development and their ability to produce clean energy. When it comes to climate change, it's not too late to act yet, but the window of opportunity is closing fast. That's why it's so important to tell our leaders we support the Paris Agreement and why it's so important for each of us to do our part now before it really is too late. Thank you for watching Global Weirding. Be sure to go to globalweirdingseries.com every other Wednesday so you don't miss the new episode. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter, and check out our Facebook Live discussion every other Thursday after each new episode at 7 p.m. Central. See you next time.